The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. We were in worship this morning, and this ties in with the message, and I didn't speak it during worship because I saved it for right now. I saw the Lord come out with a giant paintbrush, and I saw America from above, and he painted all of the land of America as a giant flag, the American flag, and I said, Lord, what does that mean? And he said, the red is for my blood for forgiveness of America's sins. The white is for purity and a move of holiness that I'm leading America into. He said, the blue is for the revelation that I am pouring out into the hearts of my church. And I said, Lord, what are the stars? And the Lord says, the stars are for the fire and the light of revival that I'm going to spread across this nation. America is not done. I encourage you to not listen to the doom and gloomers. But I wanted to go back and read to you just a compilation of some prophetic words that were spoken. All of them were spoken uh, back in 2009. And I prophesy them to you today. America has entered into an era, a great new era. That is why they report it's the end. They say it's the end of this nation. They say it's the end of a people, but it's not. God says it's the end of an era and the beginning of another that men cannot see. The spirit of Christ is upon this nation. There is a resurrection that is about to take place. There is a whole new sway that's going to happen. The spirit of the Lord says the raven shall no longer feed the eagle, America, now they say, look at them. They have entered a time of famine, but God says, no, the time of the raven has come to an end. God says that storehouses are about to open, will wipe out the slate, and there shall be a key that I will give. You're in trouble, but they're telling you, and they're telling you that you're in trouble, but God has a plan for this nation. There's a spirit of resilience upon the people of God, the ability to recover quickly, rapid recovery. People shall say, alas, we are doomed, but God says, no, for out of this pain, I will bring great, great joy. Your ladder, ladder shall be greater than your former. The latter rain shall bring the portion you have prayed for. And I have not turned my ear from you, America. The north wind comes to blow upon the garden of this nation. I will bring forth a new aroma and a new era, and my church shall rise up in victory. America is on the verge of a change. There's been a war in the heavens for the United States of America. I'm sorry, I lost my place. But this that is about to be born in one of the holiest moves of my spirit, and it shall be done with the most unholy people that are alive today, says the Lord. Do not fall for this that they've said, and I will... I will, I say, says the Lord, it shall not be so. The movement that is about to be born shall bring holiness and bring life and sanctity in this nation shall be shaken to the core. But God says, I'm the one shaking and I will bring forth the new, says the Lord. I remember back in 2014, Larry Randolph was prophesying, and he said that God was beginning to uncover the hidden things of wickedness, that God was uncovering evil, and surely God has done that. This, he's pulled the rock up, and we've seen the, we've seen the evil underneath the rock, and the Lord wanted us to see that because now he is going to clean house. America is not over. America has a yet unfinished assignment. And I know Dennis has said, has said this from time to time, and I suppose maybe he got it from somebody else, but he said, if you want to live a long life, be about the business that God created you for. Yeah. 
be about your destiny and God will see to it that you're here to bring it to an end. Now, destiny applies to individuals. We know that. But destiny also applies to nations. We all know that Israel is a covenant nation. The Israelites are a people chosen by God. They were given a land that he revealed to Father Abraham. God himself made a covenant with a nation. There's one other nation that's been specifically chosen to be a covenant nation. And that blessed nation is the United States of America. Now, the first thing that God did in my life when I was first saved he taught me history. He taught me world history. He didn't, before I found a church, before God started teaching me the Bible, before God started opening my eyes to, to his uh, eternal purpose for the church, God took history and he spread it out in the big picture, in total concept. I don't know where all that's going to lead but I do know that I love history I have a passion for history and I see God's hand throughout all of history America is a nation founded under God with the call and a yet unfulfilled destiny Christopher Columbus by the way his name Christopher means light Christ bearer He lived from 1451 to 1506, but his personal journals were not discovered and made public until the 1970s. It was uh, Peter Marshall and another writer that he worked with from um, in books about America. This is quoted from Christopher Columbus's journals. At this time, I have seen and put in study to look into all the scriptures which the Lord has opened to my understanding. It was the Lord who put into my mind, and Cliff, we have a picture. I could feel his hand upon me, the fact that it would be possible to sail. All who heard of my project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me. There is no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit, because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from his holy word. I am a most unworthy sinner, but I have cried out to the Lord for grace and mercy, and they have covered me completely. I have found the sweetest consolation since I made it my whole purpose to enjoy his marvelous presence. For the execution of the journey, I did not make use of intelligence, mathematics, or maps. It is simply the fulfillment of what Isaiah had prophesied, Isaiah 49, verses 1 and 6. Listen to me, O coastlands, and hearken, you people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The Lord made me a messenger of the new heavens and the new earth, of which Isaiah speaks, and St. John in the book of Revelation, and he showed me the place where to find it. Now we know that The truth has been removed from our history books in this nation. Our children have not been taught the truth. They've not been taught what the founding of this nation was all about. And they've been taught many things that are just outright lies. And they defile the men and women who were used by God in the making of this great nation. I wouldn't read any history unless I specifically was sure the stand of the person who wrote it, any history that's been written after the 1930s. Now this, quotes from Thomas Paine, his little booklet, Common Sense, speaks of this. 
Thomas Paine says, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, was preceded by the discovery of America as if the Almighty graciously meant to open a sanctuary to the persecuted in future years when home should afford neither friendship nor safety. And then he said, This new world has been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. Hither have they fled, not for the tender embraces of the mother, but from the cruelty of the monster. And it is so far true of England that the same tyranny which drove the first immigrants from home pursues their descendants still. Tyranny is not just a form of government. Tyranny is a spirit. Tyranny is a demonic monster. Now, could we see the next picture, Cliff? Now, you must understand that when God is doing something, the enemy is also doing something. And you can actually see throughout American history, you can see God versus greed, good versus evil. So I want to do a parallel here. 1519, Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation begins. And by the way, in this time, and I won't do those pictures. I might do them in another teaching that I do, that I don't know what you were taught about the Crusades in school. But what was going on in the world there was Islamic Jihad was being waged. They were taking Christian lands. They were enslaving young female children and making them sex slaves. They were enslaving young Christian boys, and they were either either making eunuchs and slaves out of them, or they were raising them up to be warriors of jihad. That's who populated the great armies of Islam. Christian boys and girls who had been kidnapped from home. And they came to Spain. They took all North Africa that at one time was a Christian nation. They tried to break into Europe. They tried to get up to Italy. They came down in a northern attempt to come down through um, Austria. And this went on. Jihad started with Muhammad, he died in 632, and since that time, up until 1920, the back the Ottoman Empire was divided in World War I, jihad has been waged continuously in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of battles. The Crusades lasted for a short period of time, in a relatively small number of battles, but it was able to stop the onslaught, at which point all of Christendom would have come under Islam. The Protestant Reformation would have been stopped, and America would never have been a Christian nation. Islam is the fiercest foe of Christianity and has been from the beginning. However, if you look at the size of the enemy... You look at what's going on in the world today, and it's like, who would have ever thought this at the end of World War I when they divided up the Ottoman Empire and purposely to bring it to an end? Who would have ever thought we would be where we are today under the threat of Islamic Jihad taking over? But God did not let it stop the Protestant Reformation. He used those brave knights of the Crusades to prevent Europe from being taken and Christianity being wiped from the earth. That same enemy has been raised up in our time along with communism and socialism an additional enemy, and God is not going to allow them to overtake the work that he's doing. You can see the size of the enormity of the move of God that's coming when you look at the size and the enormity of the enemy. We are facing an awakening 
the likes of which the world has never seen because this is the time when God the Father is going to visit his people and raise up the army of the Lord. And we're going to walk in the greater works of John 14. Okay, 1519, Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation begins. 539, the light of Christ begins to come. Can you see the yellow on the map? The red and the yellow dots. Christian missionaries started coming to this new land that Christopher Columbus had claimed for God. On the coastlands, the east coast and the west coast, and up the east coast of Canada, God started shining his light. And I'm going to tell you something. And I'm speaking as one who has American Indian ancestry. God sent the gospel to those savages. There was nothing good in those Indian tribes. They were demonic. They were evil. When you read of stories like what they did to the martyr Sir Isaac Jogue, who went up to the Huron and the Iroquois Indians in Canada, and some of his missionaries that he was working with were captured when they were going out to get supplies. And Isaac Jogue had the chance to get away. But he didn't. He chose to stay with his men. And those savages literally ate their fingers off with their teeth, mutilated them horribly. Eventually, Isaac Jogue was able to get back to England where he recovered his health. He was so mutilated that no one could tell who he was. And yet he chose of his own free will when he recovered to go back to these Indians because God loved them and God was sending Jesus Christ to set them free from their demonic from the demonic strongholds in this land and he won many to the lord before he was out one day and one planted a tomahawk in his head and he did become a martyr this is what the indians were like now there were five they called them the civilized tribes the creek and the uh, cherokee and other tribes because they were not as demonic and not as horrible these were horrible horrible people they'd never built anything they'd never accomplished anything and yet god sent missionaries to set them free and win them to the lord there is no such thing as the noble savage that man in a pure state without civilization man to his core without jesus is exceedingly evil God sent the light of Christ to them, and many paid with their lives. Now, the word got out just what Christopher Columbus had prayed for, that this became a beacon. This became a beacon for freedom for people suffering, suffering from tyranny and religious persecution. An early group, the French Huguenots, fled from massacres in France, hundreds of years of massacres, including the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in which men, women, and children were killed and the rivers ran red with their blood for months. I also have French Huguenots in my ancestry who later came and settled in North Carolina. Jean Ribot was one of the early French Huguenots, and he, in 1564, a group of Huguenots started a settlement at the mouth of the St. John's River near present-day Jacksonville, Florida, only to be slaughtered by the Spanish conquistadors. See, God was sending missionaries, but explorers and conquistadors were coming and exploiting the people and stealing their gold. So there was God what was God doing? What was the evil? What was the devil doing? God versus greed. Jean Ribot, the governor of this small group, began to cry out as he was martyred. And he cried out from Psalm 132 that he would not give sleep to his eyes until God made this a dwelling place for his glory. This was the first covenant 
sealed by the blood of a martyr, that this great land that the Christ bearer had first come to would be set aside to become a dwelling place for God. In 1565, the first permanent European colony in North America formed St. Augustine. And let's go to the next slide. Now with all these explorers and all these missionaries and all this activity going on, there was a cartographer, a map ma maker, Samuel de Champlain. And interestingly enough, he mapped up in Canada, down, can you see Massachusetts MA there? And there's a yellow cross over Massachusetts. He put Cape Cod, Plymouth, Massachusetts, which would once be, someday be Plymouth, Massachusetts, on the map, literally. Now, the pilgrims, shortly thereafter, set sail for Virginia. But great storms arose, and it said they did not sail anywhere at all, but the storms blew them to Plymouth, a place already picked out by God because it was not under the control of the East London Company where the Jamestown settlement had been established in Virginia. They were actually not under any specific government or beholden to any specific company, and therefore they were free to set up their own form of government. God blew them to Plymouth, Massachusetts for freedom. And these pilgrims who had fled from persecution, and I don't know if you ever saw um, the documentary, The Monument by Kirk Cameron. He goes through the story of the pilgrims. And when I saw that, I realized that the history I had read on the pilgrims had not adequately covered the suffering they endured, their imprisonments, the, um, the harshness which, with which they were treated. These were men and women who had already been formed in the crucible of suffering before they ever came to this land. They were willing to pray, pay the price. The pilgrims believed that God had promised them a new land, just as he had Abraham. Genesis 21, 1, Genesis 12, 1 was the verse of scripture that God quickened to their hearts. As the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And then G Genesis 12, 18 also, they felt that along with Abraham, that God had promised that through their descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. They believed that they had come to raise a shining city on a hill, the light of which all the nations of the earth would see. Now, the Christians were committed to covenant with God and to one another. And they also received as theirs, Genesis 17, 7 through 8, I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will give you and your descendants the land of your sojournings. When the pilgrims finally disembarked from the Mayflower, they prophetically placed their feet on Plymouth Rock, which was a type of Christ the Rock on which they were establishing. This, this was the seed plot of the nation and the new beginning for their lives. And they wrote the Mayflower Compact, and they established the first clear government, not under any other nation, but clear government that they were making with themselves under God and it was based on the freedoms promised 
in the Bible. And later, in the early years of the colonies and all through the history leading up to the Revolutionary War, these same principles were used in the state constitutions and the laws that the people advanced, uh, the, the, the laws that they made in this land, that freedom was preached from the pulpits. The truth about American history was taught in the churches because, see, freedom is God's cause. When Jesus came to, when he said he came to set the captives free, he didn't mean just individually, not just individual freedom. That the principles of free civil government came directly from the Bible, just as the principles of free enterprise come directly from the Bible. And, by the way, the pilgrims set up an economic system not based on socialism or Christian communism or something, as was the Jamestown settlement was obliged to follow because they were under the rules of the London Company, but the pilgrims were free to go to the Bible and look for God's principles of free enterprise. And after a few hard years, they prospered because of it. Now, one very interesting um, fact here, when the pilgrims got off their ship at Plymouth Rock, and they were setting up their first settlements. It's so prophetic. It's just, um, I can't go into all the details here. But one of the things they did was they met an Indian who was a Christian. And he believed that it was the purpose for his life to stay with them and help them in any way that he could. He felt like that was his destiny. Now, his, tri his family had been wiped out by one of the um, non-Christian tribes of enemies, so non-Christian tribes of Indians. So he had no family, no friends, no tribe. So the pilgrims became, became his tribe. Now, the Puritans who came later, of course, had a Christian worldview, and they believed in the depravity of man, that man, apart from Jesus, can be desperately wicked. And so when they ran into hardships over the years, Indian massacres, so forth, other things, America as a nation turned back to God in times of trouble, repented for scattering their charms, forgetting God. And God, as they repented, God would bless them once again. So there was this continual cycle of repentance and renewal of covenant going on in this land. Now, just as with the pilgrims, just as with the Huguenots, God doesn't need many but he does need people who are committed. He only needs a remnant, but they have to be willing to give their all for God. So we're a covenant nation. Let's have the next slide. The founding fathers and the framers of our Constitution were very concerned at that time. Could a new form of government be born and sustain itself without doing what civilizations had always done in history, either sliding into anarchy or coming under tyranny? And as Thomas Jefferson looked back in history, he found a couple of examples, one from the Bible, and another in a group of people who had managed to sustain what he called people's law, where the people are the government. The people gov are, are governed by a government that they in turn govern. 
Could it be done? They called it the American experiment. Would this work? Could a people actually govern the government? Could a people actually be free under a civil government? This was the great quandary that our founders had. And you know what they worried about at this time? Because they could look back to the pilgrims and see their commitment. And they could look at society. And uh, Benjamin Franklin said one could practically go their whole life in America, in the colonies at that time, and never meet a single unbeliever. It was a Christian nation. But our founding fathers and the framers looked back to the purity and the commitment of the pilgrims, and they knew that they fell short. And so they, they wondered, this form of government is only for a good people. Are we good enough to sustain this government? And they wondered at the time. That says a lot about where we find ourselves today. Now, if you look at the diagram, the Plymouth Colony in 1620 a group of committed Christians who dedicated their lives, made a covenant with God. The Jamestown settlement in Virginia, where they sent a bunch of English lords over to start a settlement. Well, I don't know if you know this about the system, uh, caste system in England. If you were a lord or lady, you did not work. You had other people work for you. I don't remember, those of you who saw My Fair Lady with um, Audrey Hepburn in it, and there was a young fellow that fell in love with Eliza Doolittle, and they were going to get married. Well, he would lose his right to his inheritance if he married a commoner, and, but of course he couldn't work, so Eliza said that she would take care of him as a shop girl. She'd have to be the one who'd work. So they sent a bunch of lords who didn't work to Jamestown, plus the London Company imposed Christian communism or a form of communism, socialism on them. And so do you know what they did? They stole from the Indians. So you see God and greed there. In 1730s, the first Great Awakening, over in Europe, it was the Age of Enlightenment, which was actually humanism rising itself up as an enemy of Christianity. Modern reasoning exalted as a god over the true god. The French Revolution, the American Revolution, you see good and you see evil. They literally destroyed their own country with a reign of terror in the French Revolution. They destroyed their economy. They killed the middle class. They um, wiped out the church. Sir Edmund Burke, uh, one of the early conservative thinkers, said this is a marvelous thing which France has done in their revolution. They have utterly destroyed themselves. So the French Revolution that destroyed a nation plus the American Revolution that birthed a nation. And so on and on through history, God was working, but also evil working. The Second Great Awakening, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And at the same time, the Second Great Awakening, which was instilling the life of Christ and holiness into the people, Robert Owen, Horace Mann, Karl Marx, socialism and communism was, um, was consolidating itself as a force in the world, and it sprung forth in 1917 in Russia, and we see the Bolshevik Revolution, and you see what happens when socialism, communism comes to full flower between 1917 and 1999. Communists who tried to impose this on the people killed 161 million innocent men, women, and children setting up their ideology. If you want to know what kind of a tree you're dealing with, look at the fruit it produces, ultimately. Okay, and so then you had presidents, some presidents, modern presidents who were working for America, and then you have the progressive presidents who want to make this a Marxist secular land. You had Calvin Coolidge and Ronald Reagan, 
in the 1900s. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson, R Richard Nixon, and Jimmy Carter all trying to tear America down and destroy America from what it was built by God to be. Now, can a nation be reborn? Can a nation that's almost completely lost its roots and lost its history go back to what God intended for it to become? The answer is yes. And I'll give you one example. You've heard about the seven pillars of society, the seven mountains of society, which is business, education, the family, religion. I probably can't name them all here. Just um, the church. Okay. Our founders, they had all seven pillars of society. Every single one of them was run with Jesus as the Lord. Now I would say it looks like we've lost them and even the church is being infiltrated. However, in the 1700s, it was said that England, once a Christian nation, had become so wicked that it could hardly be believed that it had ever once been a Christian nation. John Wesley comes on the scene, a type of an apostolic father. He gathers committed Christians. He goes into the workhouses, the poorest of the poor. He teaches them finances. He teaches them God. Methodism is what his movement was called because it teaches people to be responsible and to be, let's see, responsible and um as a civic duty as well as in the church and their church responsibilities, including personal holiness, personal prayer, and so forth. So it touched all areas of the individual's lives, and they began to win souls, and they raised finances. And it said that although John Wesley died with almost just the shirt on his back, that God had literally channeled vast amounts of wealth through him. And these Methodists built orphanages and schools, and they changed an entire nation in John Wesley's lifetime. And England became once again a Christian nation. So we have a type, we have a signpost in history that it can be done. Now let's go to the next picture. And this might look a little complicated to you, but what it is, it starts with 30 AD, the birth of the church. Now there's a timeline up at the top that goes from 30 AD to 2000 and beyond. But if you look at the diagram, the triangle underneath, this is what happened to the world. This is what happened to civilization from 30 AD. It was about 100 years of Book of Acts revival, and then the entire world slid, slid into darkness. The Dark Ages, appropriately named, although now they're dividing it up into something Middle Ages and this Middle Ages, but it was a truly dark time. Even the ability to read was lost to all but a small elite. So Thomas Jefferson looked back in history. He found one example of people's law in the Bible under Moses and one place where it actually happened in history. 450 A.D., the Anglo-Saxons, as they were later called, started a civilization on the British Isles. And, wonder of wonders, they modeled the government they set up by the government that Moses had set up under the advice of his father-in-law Jethro. It was divided up exactly as Jethro had told Moses so the people wouldn't be too much of a burden and divided it into one of the words that they used for somebody who would oversee 10 families was a tithing man. 
interesting terminology. But they maintained a system of people's law that lasted until 1066 A.D., the Norman Conquest. And they went back under tyranny, the Normans who came up from France. But the seed of freedom was planted in the hearts of every true Englishman. And they began the long struggle because freedom once lost is not easily regained. And they struggled. And in 1215, they imposed the Magna Carta. The king is not above the law. The king must also obey laws. The, the aristocracy is not above the law. The rulers of the people are under the same laws as the people of the nation. They forced them in 1264 to establish the first system of parliament. Let's see, I can't read those to see. 1688, the English Bill of Rights. 1628, the Petition of Rights. These Englishmen who had freedom burning in their hearts now started to flee oppression and religious and civil oppression and began to come to America. But not just from England, from other nations too, but the freedom that God had put in the hearts of Englishmen affected the foundations of this nation in a most marvelous way. 1620, the Mayflower Compact. 1776, the Declaration of Independence and Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. 1787, the U.S. Constitution. 1791, the U.S. Bill of Rights. Freedom is God's cause. God sent them here. God's hand was upon Benjamin Franklin and James Madison and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And they created a beautiful flower of freedom planted in the nations and it's God's flower of freedom and God will see to it that freedom is never snuffed out from the earth Amen. now let's go to the next slide in its history America has gone through four great crucibles the first was the 1776 of the revolutionary war that followed and the years of struggling as the new nation went into inflation and a time of near anarchy after the war until they prevailed on delegates to form a constitutional convention. You don't know of the struggles. You, you hear about the we won the war and all that, but it was about 20 years of great struggle after that in the forming of a new nation. Now, what our, founder, our founders did not start slavery, but they inherited a system of slavery. They abhorred slavery almost to a man, and they wondered, what can we do with this system we've inherited? How can we get rid of this blight? Because after all, all men are created equal. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, God-given rights— and so they set about, even at that time, planning how they could get rid of slavery. Unfortunately, in the years before the Civil War, it looked like the abolitionists were going to prevail. It looked like slavery was going to be wiped out from the colonies. There was a growing agreement that that should be the case. However, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin and cotton became king in the south and the southerners refused to give up their slaves because now they needed them to harvest the cotton that was making them so very prosperous and so a great war was fought John Quincy Adams the son of John Adams had in his heart I am here for a purpose. I'm not sure if he ever understood it because his presidency wasn't all that great and his, his time as a, a congressman wasn't all that memorable. But he had worked out 
a plan for liberating the slaves. And he shared that plan with a man that he bet in Congress. And that man's name was Abraham Lincoln. And that was the exact plan that Abraham Lincoln had set up to get to make sure that the slaves were finally free. So they weren't perfect men, our founders, but they had a heart after God and a heart for the good of the people, and they abhorred slavery. So 1861, and actually there were hundreds of thousands of brave men who died in that war so that the slaves could be set free because all men are created equal and all men have a right to liberty. The next great crucible was the Great Depression. And actually that was a man-caused depression. It was caused by Franklin Roosevelt who prolonged it and he got the seeds of socialism flowering in Washington, D.C. because of the Great Depression. We still have the effects of what he has done to this nation. The crucible that we are facing now, however, in 2016, is globalism versus nationalism. Will we let people like George Soros come and make us a hemispheric, no-border, mass of land, and George Soros hates our states because they have sovereignty and they make it difficult to take control of America. So the plan is to do away with our state lines and divide America up into 10 regions under 10 governors. So right now, are we going to be a nation with borders, a sovereign nation with borders and our own laws and a free people? Are we going to let the global elites take us over? That is what this election is about. Now, fortunately, Great Britain stood up to the same agenda of the European Union and said, no, I don't know if you know Nigel Farage. He's one of my hero heroes. He spent 25 years of his life dedicated to only getting Great Britain's independence back and getting them out of the European Union. The people are turning. God is raising up a spirit where people are crying out for freedom in their own lands. They're crying out for a new Independence Day. Great Britain has a new Independence Day, and we need to have a new Independence Day that we will celebrate as much as we celebrate the original Independence Day of July 4th. Because God will have a free people. Yeah. Now, there are more than just civil restorations. God, of course, we know, is into church restoration and into Christian nation restoration. Let's go to the next um, four restorations. Now, there is a revival is one thing. An awakening is something else. An awakening, a revival can stir up people's passions, turn them back to the Lord with new fervor, and the revivals tend to last three or four years. An awakening, an awakening is something that's much longer lived. In the 1700s, the first great awakening, and by the way, God continuously sent at least refreshings and revivals to America and kept turning us back to him. Interestingly enough, we have not had a true revival since 1900. I believe God wanted us to see how bad things will get without that. That is why we're here today, because we've seen what will happen if God doesn't intervene in the church and in our affairs. The first great awakening, and there was a marvelous truth that was spread across the colonies at this time, and that truth is that Jesus saves. And the message of salvation actually went through the colonies. It said that George Whitfield's 
had preached at least once to every man, woman, and child in the colonies. At least 80% of the population had heard George Whitfield speak. And in the common experience of salvation, the colonies all of a sudden had common experiences with other colonies. Now they were united by a love of Jesus Christ. And so it cut through state lines. It cut through denominational lines. And now men testified of this experience in Christ. And in that time, the United States was finally the United States of America. Remember what Jean Ribot asked God to do, to do to make this a dwelling place of God? He prayed for the unity where God himself would dwell in the midst of a unified people. That word united is so important, a United States of America. Look what's happened to us now. We're a divided States of America. But God had a signpost in Charleston, not that, I believe, a year or two ago when a white man came to a meeting in a black church and killed all the people there, and they sent agitators in to stir up the people and cause riots, and both black and white refused because in Jesus Christ there is no male, female, black, white, Scythian, or Jew. We're all one. And they couldn't do anything and the black people and the white people hugged and they attended memorial services and they all held hands. And it was a wonder before the world. And it was a picture of the unification that God's going to bring in this nation in the coming moves of God. 1700s, the first awakening, the salvation experience to the church. 1800s, the second great awakening, it was the truth that Jesus is our life. This was a revival that, that started in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, and it kept on in different emphases for a hundred years. As soon as one wave would stop, another wave came. And the people learned, okay, I'm saved but I don't look much like Jesus. This was also called the holiness revival. You see, we were not made with the capacity to live the Christian life. We were created in the image of God to be a container. We have no separate life. We are made to be containers of God. Adam and Eve, when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, let's call it the tree of death, they became filled by a spirit of death. This was spiritual death. This is why when Jesus went to the cross, he not only went to the cross personally, all humanity was out, gathered up by God with the Father and went to the cross so we can say, I am crucified with Christ. It is now not devil life filling me, but now Christ's life can fill me. And I can be a partaker in his resurrection and ascension, even up to John 14, where Jesus says, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and the Father who's in me does the works. And it's you and me, and I and you, and the Father and I will come and make our home in you, the church that does the greater works. Now, the second great awakening, they learned to take Christ not just as their Savior or as their influence, but Christ as their very life. Now, when God does a new awakening, he gathers up old truth that's been mostly forgotten from former awakenings, brings it in a new package, resurrects that, and then adds new truth to it. So the second great awakening, the holiness movement, because only Jesus in us can live the Christian life. Apart from him, you truly can do nothing. We've learned about Christ in us. The truth that's going to rise up is Christ as us, living his life in us. The second great awakening. Now, in the 1900s, God was doing something, and I will get to it on the next slide. But what we're looking for is the third great awakening, which is going to be 
Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Have the heart of the Father for a life of love lived in service for other people. Take, take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. And Paul said, present your bodies a living sacrifice so you too can live as the Savior lived on earth. This is knowing the Father. The first awakening, it was knowing the Son. The second awakening was knowing the Holy Spirit. This next awakening is going to be a revelation of Father God, and He is going to do the works through us, and He is going to get about His business in our lives. This is what is coming. This is what's on the horizon. Now let's go to the next one. In the 1900s, all of a sudden, the revival stopped and the awakening, awakening stopped. Why? Has God been doing nothing during that time? No, he's been preparing his church for the next move of God. In the 1950s, he restored pastors to the church. It used to be that pastors were hired by people and run by the people. In the 1960s, the Spirit of God the charismatic renewal, the 1970s, the teachers, 1980s, the prophets were restored to the church, 1990s, the apostles were restored to the church. Still not fully functioning, mind you. In the 2000s, in two, the two, starting in 2000, the miracles of God, we started seeing people be raised from the dead and God restoring miracles and signs and wonders to the church. Sid Roth, every meeting he goes to, he starts out... Uh, with all these unsaved Jews, he starts out with words of knowledge of physical healings and signs and wonders that God's doing. And their response is nearly um, 90 to 99% of the unsaved Jews are getting saved in his meetings because God is restoring signs and wonders and miracles to his church. In 2012, it said that the government of God was set in place and now ready to function, but God has not activated the functioning yet. In 2020-something, 20, we will see the unity. We will see one nation under God. We will see the prayer of Jesus in John 17 answered under a fully functioning church government under the fivefold ministries given by Jesus himself to build his church, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the evangelists, and the teachers. And sometime in the future, with the restoration of that, we're going to see the glorious church that Jesus wants. And the world will see his glory resting upon us. So, I want to share one other thing that happened that just turned the world of political science upside down. You ask, how can we have world peace? How can um, we have freedom from war and all that? Well, one thing, it was discovered that democracies, and I'm talking about democratic republics. You know, when I say democracy, I don't mean just majority rule because we have America's a republic. Well, first of all, Protestant missionaries, this Robert Woodbury discovered years and years of research his um the his work was published in 2012 he discovered that protestant missionaries sent from the united states of america made democracy available to the world why because when the missionaries came they converted the people to christianity again a common salvation experience they planted churches. They promoted education so people could read their Bibles. They taught a Christian worldview. They taught the principles of free enterprise. They built charitable institutions like orphanages and so forth and hospitals. They created the conditions that made democracy possible. And this led to the installation of civil governments with constitutions similar to America. America is the freedom model, is God's freedom model for the world. But Christianity makes that freedom model possible. And they found out that if nations did not convert to Christianity, an emperor or king or some other form of tyranny 
always rose up in those lands. John Adams says, We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. And by the way, the words on the base of the Statue of Liberty quote a par part of a poem written by Emma Lazarus over 130 years ago. It's called the New Colossus. And let me explain that to you. At the base of this statue, it says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, Send these homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. What does this mean? Does it mean that all the, the wretched people from the world that we are obligated to take them all in? Actually, it doesn't mean that. The golden door, the torch of liberty is the golden door of the freedom model that says we have shown you now the way for your opportunity, your liberty, and your freedom, but it's up to individuals and nations to choose that door. So what is America's unfinished assignment? Well, our unfinished assignment is to be a force for good in the world. Our unfinished assignment is to remain that model of freedom. Our unfinished assignment is to finance the spread of missions. Our unfinished assignment is to continue to be a force for freedom, spread the gospel, and provide stability in the world. And by the way, the destiny of America is intertwined with Israel. As Sid, Roth, as Sid Roth points out, spell Jerusalem, J E R U S A L E M, that we are intertwined with Jerusalem. We're to be a blessing to the nations. We've been blessed with creativity, leadership, and innovation. It takes freedom and finances to send the gospel to the world. We are not finished yet. America is not finished yet. But we do have a choice and we do need to vote. And we do need to pray and encourage others to vote. We're up against a demonic agenda aimed at destroying the global force for God's kingdom expansion in the world. So we're up against a battle against the kingdom of God as much as a battle against our nation but God is not through and don't listen to the doom and gloom we have a part to play we like Esther have been placed here for such a time as this so don't lose heart America has an unfinished assignment amen You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly, 
and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.